All right. Uh, hey there. Uh, my name is Scott Lemon. I'm a teacher with Calgary Board of Education, uh, phys ed teacher, which is uh, pretty awesome. Um, so I get to, you know, teach disc golf to my students and, and um, I just, uh, I love the game. I started uh, about seven or eight years ago. A um, friend of mine, a fellow phys ed teacher introduced me to the game out at Forest Lawn uh, uh, Disc Golf Park, uh, just off 52nd. Uh, here in Calgary and uh, yeah I just uh, fell in love with playing disc golf and joined the club uh, shortly thereafter and uh, have been uh, starting to explore a little bit more. I uh, got into my first tournament and got my PDGA number a couple of years ago and I uh, just love playing so that's kind of how I got into disc golf. Um, yeah so Kyle uh, calls Kyle's wires is here with me as well and he's one of our uh, most committed junior players um, he's always out working on his game. So he's going to tell you a little bit about how he got into disc golf here. Yeah. So I actually started through, um, uh, my sister, and my mom went out with some friends, uh, during the summer and they said our family should try it out. And I instantly fell in love with it. Uh, they don't really play anymore funny enough. Um, but I try to play every day and yeah, I've been playing for about six months now and it's going good. Right on. Awesome, Kyle. So we're just going to get started here with a, a quick introduction um, for junior players. If you've never played before, I know that there's probably uh, not too many junior players watching now, but hopefully uh, on our uh, on our rebroadcast, uh, we get some junior players uh, um, viewing this. And uh, so just starting off with the equipment on the disc golf course um, is very basic and simple to understand, uh, as it states here. Um, typical disc golf basket. You'll find different uh, different types of disc golf baskets, and that's kind of the fun and uh, uniqueness of, of the sport. Um, but this is kind of like your typical disc, disc golf basket here with the chains hanging down and the basket underneath. Um, the equipment that you need is, uh, you know, pretty basic. If you have a driver and a putter, you're pretty much set. Um, at, at a lot of the courses, uh, or at some of the courses here in Calgary, uh, if you're playing a nine hole course, typically you'll, you'll be able to get by with a driver and a putter. Um, but many of us have a whole schwack load of um, gear myself. So there's my disc golf rig. I got uh, all sorts of different stuff. And it's, uh, it's funny because some rounds I'll only throw like three or four different discs. And I'm wondering why I'm carrying around a sack full of uh, heavy discs. But anyways, um, there's a, here's a typical tee box, uh, just a concrete slab that you'll find on disc golf courses. Sometimes the tee boxes are, uh, can be just like a patch of dirt. Uh, sometimes it's uh, synthetic. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the, where you can find it. A lot of the disc golf courses are multi-use areas. So, uh, you might, uh, see other people walking their dogs or, or doing whatever. Um, important thing when you're out playing disc golf is um, everybody other than you has the right of way. <laughs> so uh, if you're out playing and there's uh, other park users, um, you, you definitely wait until everything's clear. Um, if you're throwing into an area where you don't know uh, where it's going to land, so maybe a blind shot, it's best to use a spotter and have somebody go out just to make sure that the coast is clear and uh, so nobody gets injured. Um, so why disc golf? Uh, Calgary Disc Golf Club has been around since 2010, and they sponsor lots of different uh, events, leagues, and they really advocate to get uh, more courses built here in the city of Calgary and surrounding areas. Um, Calgary is a great place to be a disc golfer because there is a buffet of courses. Um, there are so many different options uh, in and around Calgary, and uh, which is great because the sport has been gaining popularity uh, recently, and uh, definitely um, a great place to to golf. So, a few reasons why uh, why disc golf is an awesome sport. Uh, it's affordable. You don't need to be booking a tee time. You can just show up to your local course and uh, jump on. Um, often people will be uh, very willing and helpful to let you play, and uh, you can join in. Uh, there's lots of creativity. Kyle and I were talking about this earlier. Um, how there's basically like infinite amount of different lines uh, that you can throw uh, with discs. Um, the flight paths are, are crazy. 
Uh, throwing stuff is fun. <laughs> and, uh, and it's also fun if you're just kind of getting started. The first time I ever disc golfed, I didn't even know I was disc golfing. I had an ultimate Frisbee and uh, we were just kind of playing gorilla golf or safari golf, um, just making up targets as we went. Uh, and that was with my phys ed staff at, at one of my uh, previous schools that I taught at. Um, another good reason, especially for juniors, is mindfulness. Um, so slowing down, connecting with nature is a great thing for everybody's mental health. So uh, getting outside, getting that fresh air with people that you enjoy being around and, uh, and always the situation when you're playing disc golf is always changing. So you don't really have time to think about, you know, what you ate for lunch or think about, you know, what you're doing on the weekend. Um, you're in the game and, and you need to be paying attention because, uh, you know, you have to be thinking and be critical um, and be on your toes and improvising. Oftentimes I find myself, you know, under a tree or in a, in a tough situation. So my scramble game has uh, become one of my strengths. Um, also for, uh, for juniors, um, independence. Uh, I grew up playing a lot of team sports and I wish I would have had an opportunity to play uh, at least one individual sport. So uh, definitely disc golf is, uh, you know, puts the uh, responsibility on the player so you know mistakes are part of learning and that's how you get better um, and for sure for myself my game really improved when I joined the club and I started making connections with people and I started uh, just seeing how other people play and getting some advice from uh, from the grandmasters and from some of the players that have played for many many years um, lastly the community, uh, the community, the disc golf community here in Calgary is amazing. Um, in a couple of weeks time, we're doing a bottle drive. Uh, so if you, anybody's got extra bottles, come on down to Don's hobby shop there on center street. Um, yeah, the community is amazing. Um, and one of the things that uh, you can find in, uh, in a lot of around a lot of courses around the first tee is the disc golfers code. So that kind of informs everybody to play smart, respect the course and represent the sport. And, uh, you know, my experience around disc golfers has been awesome. Um, for the most part, disc golfers are really responsible, um, interesting people. Uh, there's, uh, you know, from all walks. Um, and it's, it's just great because whenever you're on the disc golf course, it's all about disc golf. So uh, that's one of the things I love about uh, playing the game. So I'm going to turn it over to Kyle here. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about uh, backhands and forehands, um, kind of the two main shots that uh, you'd throw as a disc golfer, and a little bit about some basic terminology here. So, Kyle, I'll uh, hand it over to you here for a bit. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so for disc golf, the two, uh, everybody throws differently, but the two main uh, grips and throws that you're going to have and they're going to be talked about is a backhand. So this is just like you would throw a normal Frisbee. Um, it is slightly more technical, um, but that's just something that uh, comes with time. Um, and the second one is forehands. So forehand grip. Um, I personally put two fingers underneath and I believe that that's the most popular. Um, I know some people put one uh, and you can spread your fingers or put them together uh, for different shots and whatever feels comfortable. Um, so the first term we're going to talk about here is, uh, hyzer. So when you throw a disc golf disc, usually the path for the, the most standard path that it'll take is it'll go straight for a while. And then for, a, if you're right-handed and you're throwing it backhand, it'll fall off to the left-hand side at the end of its flight. And it'll be the opposite flight path for a forehand. So if you're right-handed and you're throwing a forehand, it'll fall off to the right-hand side. So what hyzer is, um, so there's hyzer angle and hyzering, and that just refers to holding the disc or the disc flying in the way it's supposed to be falling off to. So for right-hand backhand, I'm if I'm holding the disc uh, facing towards the left, that's a hyzer angle. And for a forehand holding it towards the right, that's a hyzer angle because that's the way it's going to go. That's how I like to think about it. Um, an anhyzer is just the opposite. So for if I'm holding it um, for a backhand, the opposite way of what it's going to want to do at the end 
that's an Anheuser and opposite goes for forehand. Um, if you're, and then you can also just throw the disc flat. Uh, this takes time and is usually uh, difficult to learn, uh, but angle control comes with time. Um, another shot is uh, the spike hyzer. So the spike hyzer is if you just throw it very, very steep, then it'll go up very high and fall back down. And that's very useful if you're trying to go around objects or over top of something or the likes. Awesome, Kyle. Thanks. So um, yeah, just a couple of visuals here. So spike hyzer that Kyle was talking about typically kind of follows this trajectory on the red line. Um, hyzer release with an overstable disc. And we'll talk about stability here in a bit, um, coming through here in the blue. Uh, and hyzer release. Um, on a backhand for these are all based on right hand backhand throwers uh, comes kind of up steep and then we'll crash here and then um, my mistake actually this green one is a forehand right hand forehand so as Kyle was mentioning um, just that still that hyzer line on a forehand um, so again kind of right handed trajectory for a forehand uh, sorry for a backhand here in blue and a right hand trajectory for a forehand in green. And then for lefties, uh, left handed backhand throw would take that kind of trajectory typically. And the left handed forehand would follow this green uh, line here. Um, so, talking about stability, this is one thing that uh, when I started playing, um, I just knew that I loved throwing the disc and I loved hitting putts and hearing that sound of the chains. Uh, when you cash in a pot um, and everybody around me was always talking, like I said, uh, getting out there, people don't talk about what they do for a living or, or current events or what have you on the disc golf course. It's all disc golf. Um, so people are always talking about different plastic, uh, different um, stabilities of discs. So we'll just talk a little bit about disc uh, stability here. Um, so for somebody who's just kind of getting started, junior golfer or a beginner golfer, um, the following terms get used a lot. All right. So understable, stable and overstable. OK, so this is kind of how these discs are engineered. So an understable disc will typically uh, have a flight that uh, turns right. So if it's thrown flat. So Kyle was talking about the different angles of release. So. If the disc is thrown flat, typically an understable disc will finish off to the right. Uh, a stable disc, the disc that's considered stable, will have more of a true flight, even though it, it will uh, curl a little bit, um, but that's how it's engineered. And then an overstable disc is going to finish a little bit to the left. So um, according to Innova.com, just doing a little research uh, leading into this, Understable discs are much more speed sensitive than overstable discs. So an understable disc is gonna fly stable uh, to overstable at low speed. So beginners tend to throw uh, discs at lower speed. So typically um, a beginner player would, would uh, tend to benefit from having a lighter weight disc and having a disc that's a little bit more uh, stable to over, overstable. Um, understable discs definitely can can rip at high speeds, but that takes time and, and practice. Sorry, Kyle, anything to add there? No. Okay, cool. Just, um, I, yeah, go ahead. that's all good. Terms to get started. So let's say you're a junior disc golfer, or beginner disc golfer, and you decide I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get a putter and driver, and I'm going to go to one of the local courses. So a uh, few, few different things that you're gonna want to know uh, aside from just the equipment when you're arriving at the course. Uh, typically at the first tee box, there's gonna be some disc golf rules and some etiquette. Definitely a good idea to take, take a read of that and uh, you know just educate yourself a little bit about what the course rules are. Um, but the away golfer, uh, the, and this, the, this is what I find with, uh, with junior players is they're so excited to get out and play disc golf that they throw their discs and then as soon as it's released, they run right after it. And in disc golf, like I mentioned earlier, is a great way to practice some mindfulness to kind of get out nature and to slow down the pace a little bit. So uh, at the first tee, 
Um, at the start of your round, you and your group are going to determine the throwing order. There's lots of different ways you can decide that. Typically during uh, league and tournament play, it's customary that the player with the best average or, or rating, sorry, this should say or rating, there we go, quick fixie, uh, will go first. Others are going to follow in a similar order. And then to avoid getting hit by the disc, the subsequent throwing order follows the same rules as traditional golf. So if you know golf rules, um, obviously you're not going to stand in front of the person hitting the ball. Uh, same thing in disc golf. Uh, you're going to stay behind the away golfer or the golfer that's throwing next. And, and that's kind of determined by the person whose disc is furthest from the target. And wait until that person's thrown to approach the next disc up. So it really does take a little bit of patience and some time to kind of slow that pace down. Um, sometimes the away golfer is going to be the same person for more than one shot in a row. Uh, I know that's happened to me. Um, you know, everybody tees off and my, I'm the away golfer because my disc didn't go so far. And then the next shot I throw either into the grass or into a tree or something. And then I'm still the away golfer. So it's not kind of like your turn. You know, it's, there's not a predetermined order. It kind of shows up from um, based on your throws. Um, once you're finished the, the hole, so that means that the disc must rest in the chains or in the basket below. Um, the person uh, that finished it with the lowest amount of throws is going to be uh, getting honors and teeing off first at the next hole. Um, it's expected, this is an important piece here, and this is something that you can typically see on the rules board at the first tee, uh, but for etiquette, uh, players should not be talking uh, when another player's throwing, and especially when uh, somebody's putting, because that requires the most amount of concentration. Um, and it's also good form not to stand in line with the basket when somebody else is putting, so that you're not a visual distraction. Um, number two here, I'll turn it over to Kyle. He's going to talk a little bit about marking your lie. Yeah, so um, lots of people use a mini marker to mark their discs. Uh, do you have one, Scott? Oh, uh, yeah, I got, I should have a mini right here, yeah. Yeah, so they look like this. They're just mini versions of discs. Um, and you can use this to uh, mark your disc. Uh, so you usually see this more in competitive rounds or at tournaments and stuff. Uh, but I know lots of people that still use it uh, like during the summer and stuff just to stay in the habit. So basically how it works is when, when you go to your disc and it's on the ground, uh, you'll take your marker and you'll place it in front of your disc. So in front would be if you stood behind your disc facing towards the basket, just the closest edge to the basket. Um, you then lift up your, you then can lift up your, you can take away your disc. Uh, if you want to throw that one, then you can throw it or you can throw another disc that you have. Um, and your foot basically has to be touching right behind the mini marker and how it works is it's within a sheet of papers, like area behind the disc. Yeah, absolutely, awesome. Um, one other thing here just about the, the lie is when you're putting, uh, there's something that'll be referred to as the circle. So the circle is a 10 meter radius from the uh, base of the, uh, of the basket um, from the post. And if you are, if you determine, and usually it's just a little conversation amongst the people you're golfing with, you'll say, am I inside the circle? And if they say, yes, you're inside, <clears throat> pardon me. If they say yes, that you are inside the circle, then you must maintain body control until the disc either lands in the basket or comes to rest. If you're outside of the circle, you can do what's called a jump putt, which means that as long as you release the disc before you step across the mark, um, then it's a, it's a legitimate putt. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so what, what he's saying is within, within 10 meters of the basket, you can't um, step another foot past your marker um, if you're putting. Yeah, absolutely. So that requires body control. And uh, it's a little bit different than a tee shot where, you know, you might be taking a little bit of a run, running start or you might do an X step or something like that or a crow hop uh, to get into your shot. Um, sometimes there's a string around the base of the, of the basket, but that's more typical in, uh, in tournaments and, uh, and events. Um, so moving forward here, um, flight numbers. 
So when you go in to select a disc at a, at a disc golf store or Don's Hobby Shop, um, there's lots of different locations in and around Calgary. You just uh, search it up. Um, but there are flight numbers. And it can be an overwhelming experience going in to buy a disc. I would say the most important thing to do is ask questions. Um, ask questions and do a little bit of research before. There's lots of uh, flight charts that'll give you an idea of, you know, the typical flight for right hand backhand thrower on a flat uh, on a flat release. Um, but definitely do a little bit of research and ask questions. Uh, the four numbers, just to kind of get through it relatively quickly here. I know Discraft has uh, has their own kind of one number system where a rating of zero means that the disc is stable uh, compared to um, a positive number where it's gonna be considered overstable and then negative numbers would be understable. Uh, but typically the four, the four number system um, that was first introduced by Innova is gonna be your go-to. So you can see Kyle's disc there uh, with his dragon. He's got, what do you got? Eight, five, negative two and two. two. Okay, so that's speed, glide, turn and fade. So those are all different characteristics of the disc and how it's gonna fly through the air. Um, so speed is the rate at which the disc is gonna travel through the air. It goes from one to 14, one being the slowest and 14 being the fastest. Um, glide is the second number uh, between one and seven. Uh, and glide describes the disc's ability to stay in the air, maintain that loft during flight. Um, we're talking about turn. High speed turn is going to be the tendency of the disc to turn over or bank to the right for right handed backhanded throwers uh, during the initial part of the flight. Um, the most resistance to turnover is going to be a plus one and the most conducive to turnover would be that negative five rating. And then fade uh, rated zero to five basically fade is the disc tendency to hook left for low speed uh, for right hand backhand throwers at the very finish of the flight at the very end. So fade is rated uh, zero to five. Uh, zero is gonna be your straightest and disc rated five is going to hook hard at the very finish of the flight um, and give you a little bit of that uh, action on your disc. So uh, kind of a Cole's notes there um, with uh, the number rating system, but definitely if you're going in to buy uh, your first couple of discs, ask questions, uh, do a little bit of research and, uh, and and uh, definitely don't be afraid to, um, you know, don't just go and buy the, the best looking disc that you can find. Okay. Um, I know that's kind of what I, I went in the first time I bought disc. I was like, oh, this one looks about right. And I just bought it. So make sure that you're, because discs can range between, you know, um, 15, 12 to $15 all the way up to however much you want to pay. Melissa, do you have something to... Yeah, just a question came up. Uh, for beginners, what like speed discs do you think they should start with? So you would want to have lower speed discs for uh, beginners generally because it's easier them, for them to throw. So if you have a higher speed disc, it will want to hook off very fast at the end and you won't be able to get it as far. Whereas um, for a beginner that hasn't uh, gotten the technique perfect yet and has a slower throwing speed, uh, a slower disc will go further because it'll stay straighter longer. Yeah. That's, that's definitely what you want. You wanna be able to control the disc flight when you're beginning and then start to, uh, you'll grow, you'll find, especially junior players will find that they'll grow out of discs um, fairly quickly, kind of depending on uh, how their body's changing, how they're growing, but with confidence and, and the ability to, uh, they'll, they'll typically advance to that higher speed. Uh, to get a high speed disc when you're just starting out is not a good idea <laughs> because yeah. you won't be able to control it as much. So um, we're just going to get into, uh, I know that we're kind of running, running down here, but we have uh, a couple more things that we're going to chat about. Uh, one of the cool things um, that I find, um, having been a middle school teacher for, for several years and teaching phys ed and teaching disc golf as a, as a unit in my program, um, the, the younger players really like the, the different shots and the creativity of the game. So there's 
four basic categories for uh, shot making. Um, your drive that you throw from the tee box, typically a far, far shot uh, thrown from the tee box area. Uh, fairway drive would be a second shot, uh, typically thrown on a longer distance hole, so a par four or par five. And then when you get close, to the, close enough to the basket, you try to um, eyeball your landing spot with your approach. Uh, so hopefully it gets inside that 10 meter circle. So you have a, a good look for your putt. And then your putt is your attempt to finish the hole uh, by having the disc either, like I mentioned before, stick in the chains or rest in the basket below the chains. So um, for myself, I kind of started playing a little bit more unconventional style of disc golf. Um, and I throw a lot of tomahawks. Now it can be a little bit, uh, put a little bit of wear and tear on the shoulder. Um, but it's a style of throw similar to throwing a baseball. So for right-hand backhanded thrower, um, what you're going to do is the, the grip is kind of the same as your forehand grip. You're going to, I like to do the double stack underneath the rim of the disc and then have my thumb on top. Okay. And when I go to release, I'm going to release it. This might be a little bit easier to see. I'm going to tilt it. So it's about at uh 11 or 10 o'clock on an analog okay, it's going to come out cruise off to the right and then crash down left the uh basically the inverse of that is called the thumber okay so the thumber grip as we can see here the thumb gets placed on the underside of the disc okay so this might be a better angle to show where we pinch the disc here okay and we have a tight grip right into the web of the hand between the thumb and the index finger. And then the hand is right here on the top, okay? With that knuckle gripping right in nice and tight. So with this one, we're going to tilt it to about one or two o'clock. It's gonna come out, oops, I'm sorry. It's gonna come out, it's gonna cruise off to the left and then crash down to the right, kind of like a backward seven. So uh, those are a couple, couple uh, drives or sometimes used as escape shots. Uh, if you have an obstacle um, right in your way um, that you can't throw a backhand or a forehand through. Um, Kyle's, Kyle's gonna quickly just get in here and talk about the Scooby and grenade or, or grenade and uh, turbo putt just to wrap us up here. Yeah, so for the grenade, um, this is a shot uh, is thrown uh, to do a similar purpose to Thumber and Tomahawk, usually to get over something or to put something higher up. Um, the difference is, is it's thrown, basically the grip is uh, you can hold the disc like this, the opposite of a backhand, or some people also hold it like this weird knuckle stuff. And how it works is it's similar dynamics to a backhand throw, but you're coming from very low and throwing it straight up. And theoretically what it's supposed to do is go straight up and come straight back down on its edge instead of gliding out like a tomahawk or a thumber. Um, this is very useful for getting over objects or getting out of tall bushes or something like that. Um, another shot that we have is the uh, Scooby. Um, so this is basically a forehand, but opposite direction. Um, so you can use this if you need to throw out to get around things, or uh, if you're really close to the basket, but there's something in your way, you can do Scooby putts and stuff like that. Yeah, I know that the Scooby is definitely kind of, uh, the terminology kind of gets uh, twisted sometimes. Um, some people interchange scooby and grenade uh kind of together but sometimes if i'm throwing an upside down shot that i just want to glide on the on the ground um because the where the stamp is it's going to slide a little bit better especially uh in fringe season when you're playing in the fall or uh in the spring um you might have that uh you know have a little bit more slick and greasy ground um so that the disc is going to actually travel a little bit more on the ground. Um, last one here, turbo pot. Typically, uh, the disc is oriented so that the stamp is facing up. So 
Here's my stamp. Stamp is facing up. What I want to do is actually I want to flip it upside down, put my thumb in the middle, put my fingers on the edge, and then hold it up like I'm carrying a tray. Okay. I want to try to keep it nice and flat. And when I release it, I'm going to turn my wrist so that there's going to, it's going to create a counterclockwise spin. And that'll maintain the stability through the flight. And that's a great kind of escape putt. You can see the, the picture on the right here. This guy's using the turbo putt to kind of step out of the bushes that are in, that are in his way. Because if he tried to throw a backhand, typical putt, he just crush it right into the caravan is there. there. So that's, uh, that's it for us here. Uh, Kyle, thanks so much for joining me today.